Hi, this is Steve Bick from the Vermont Forest Business School, and I'm joined by Allison Berry of Woodland Resources. Hi, Steve. Thanks for having me. Thank, thanks for being here. And, and the, the reason we're here is to put on this webcast about two exciting new mobile apps for forestry and wood products people in Vermont. Why don't we start with the backstory about these new apps and you know where they came from and, and who made them possible. So I, I had the idea to, to create some mobile apps like this for a while and then I was fortunate when an opportunity come up to have uh, to have a contract with Vermont's Working Lands Enterprise Initiative to write the apps and then to distribute them and get them into the hands of people who can use them. Well, it's interesting that the Working Lands Enterprise Initiative would get behind something like this. It, it is, and I, I was I was glad to have their involvement, and it, it, you know it, it seems to fit very well with their with their uh, mission, which is you know to provide technical and financial support to businesses and, and to service providers in Vermont's uh, agriculture and forestry sectors. Okay, so tell me a little bit more about the Working Lands Enterprise Initiative. Sure. So the Working Lands Enterprise Initiative is an office within Vermont's Department of, or not the Department, the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets. And this initiative was created in 2012 to stimulate economic development in the agriculture and forestry sectors using a mix of both public funding and philanthropic donations. So it's a state agency in the state of Vermont? It's it's part of a state agency, or it's an office with, within it, but it's a a pretty small one, a pretty a pretty lean one. And and to 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 really complete their mission, they rely on something called the Working Lands Enterprise Board, and this is comprised of some private sector people from the agriculture and forestry supply chains, who you know volunteer their time to participate, and then some representatives of some of the key state agencies in Vermont, including you know, the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets, uh, Forest Parks and Recreation, the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, the Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund, uh, Vermont's Economic Development Authority, and Vermont's Agency of Commerce and Community Development. So there's, there's uh, people in all of those agencies who, who have it as their job to you know, help people in the working lands um, community. Okay, and who is it that keeps the initiative moving forward? Uh, good question, because it, it does take, you know, uh, some leadership to bring all these people together. And so the program is is led by Lynn Ellen Schmoller, and uh, really she does a, a great job of keeping track of everything they're working on and making sure that they make progress towards their goals. So on to our topics for today. So we have a number of things to talk about in, in introducing these, these new mobile apps and talking about how to use them. To start, we'll talk about throughput accounting for key performance indicators and cadence. And really, these are the things that the, the apps are built on. So we've got to talk a, a little bit about that theory first. Uh, that was going to be my next question. What the heck is KPI and cadence? Yeah, KPI and cadence. So KPI is shorthand for key performance indica indicators. And cadence has to do with timing. In other words, how often do you make these measurements to get information you can use to help you make decisions about how to run your business? Okay, are you going to explain a little bit about what throughput accounting is also? Yes, we're going to go into those in, in quite a bit of detail as our first, okay. uh, first topic today. Okay. Then we'll talk about mobile app basics. The mobile apps we're going to use are essentially mobile websites, and that's a great way to put out mobile apps to a lot of people at low cost and make them uh, easy to update. So we'll talk about some basic information there, and then we're going to get right into it with the first with the Livid app, Login Vermont, talk about how to use it. I'm sure we'll do a live demo of that. And then we'll, we'll turn to the iSaw app, and pull that up on the screen and show you how to use that as well. Okay, sounds good. Okay, getting back to that question of yours, KPI and cadence. So KPI stands for key performance indicators and in throughput accounting, 
which is a, a, a simplified form of accounting that is tied closely to how you operate, how you run your business. So in throughput accounting, the two key performance indicators are profit and return on investment. So okay. cadence then is a, is a, you know, is a rhythmic sequence, but in business it's the frequency and timing of measuring those key performance indicators. The mobile apps will allow you to make the measurements at any time, but it'll also let you set the time frame that you want to make the measurements for. So do people using the apps need to know these numbers off the top of their head? I mean, is are they going to have these numbers available to them? Profit, return on investment, and cadence? Is that something folks will just know? Well, they will, they will when they start to use the app. So I'll explain what they need by way of background information and we'll show, show them how to put the information in there. Once that's done, we can tie them to some other key performance indicators that are more commonly used. And so if you're a logger, a lot of times your, your, your big indicator that you have in mind is how many loads did I produce? How many loads did we get out today? How many loads did we get out this week? Probably weekly is more important. And then maybe how many loads came out for the entire job? Now, if you're someone with a portable sawmill business, your performance indicator is probably how many board feet did you, did you saw? So if, if we can make it so people can take that information that they're already kind of keeping track of upstairs and put it into the app and get profit and return on investment, then we've, we've really provided them with something. So that's, that's the goal here. All right. So in, in terms of key performance indicator, we need a few th the, uh, key performance indicators of profit and return on investment. We need to start by knowing a few things. And these are uh, the investment, the level of investment in the business and how it's uh, allocated over time, the revenue or throughput, how much is coming in, and then operating expenses, how much is, how much is going out. So if we know those things, we can calculate profit and return on investment. Okay. And then getting back to this idea of cadence, uh, pretty commonly in accounting, we look at things on a monthly or quarterly or an annual basis. And that's fine, but it, it's, it's not is, is, uh, easy to tie that to what's actually going on in the business. So, uh, so in, the, you know, in the producer world, when, when people are, are farming or fishing or, forest or in, working in forestry, things don't happen neatly on a week-to-week -week or day-to-day -day basis. One season isn't really like the next. We tend to have periods of high productivity followed by periods of lower productivity. So uh, making our measurements in a conventional way doesn't always tell us very much. So... Do you find that people in the forest products industry, uh, for them, these like, monthly and quarterly um, facts and figures aren't as useful as maybe something shorter, like a weekly or monthly? Right. I mean, the, the, there's nothing wrong with them, but if you found out you had a good quarter, then you have mm -hmm. to ask yourself, okay, what happened in this quarter? And what happened, mm -hmm. in, and it might be a combination of multiple different jobs or locations or orders. So, so why not why not build our timing of measurements around those orders or around those specific jobs and then that way know how we performed in any given assignment or project okay so it makes it easier to compare say like job to job or week to week e exactly okay and and if you want to know more about throughput accounting, I am going to go to it, go in, into it in a little bit more detail. But there's an article I did for the Northern Logger uh, a few years ago, and I posted on the loggingchance.com website. So if you if you're the kind of person that really needs a good explanation of accounting, that's a good place to go for it. All right. All right. So let's talk about those three pieces of information: investment, revenue and operating expenses that we need to get our measurements of profit and uh, return on investment. So we have that investment. We have to figure out, you know, how much of it there is and, 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 uh, and how much of it we use up over time or how, how much we need to measure against. So, so what are the kinds of things that like a logger might invest in? So, so loggers pretty much invest in equipment. Right. All right. And, and equipment is something that uh, doesn't just earn money. It's not like 
you know, buying a mutual fund and then it starts to earn for you, hopefully. You buy a piece of equipment and all you've bought is productive capacity and then you have to have some other inputs to make it work. The other thing about this investment is it doesn't appreciate in value, almost never. What happens is it wears out. The more you use it, the more worn out it gets. So in measuring our investment in a particular week or month or individual job, we'd like to know how much of the investment we used up while we were there. So I like to look at it in terms of hourly or daily depreciation. Now, how many days were you there? Uh, if we know a piece of equipment is going to uh, decrease in value by a certain amount over a year, and we know that we work 180 days in a year, we can come up with the average daily depreciation. And that's, that's one part of it. Okay. What are the other parts here? Well, there's a, there's a little bit more, more to it in that you buy the entire piece of equipment and you use it up, but chances are you're going to use it for a while and then trade it in or sell it. Or maybe right. you're going to use it until it's it's really worn out, but even then you can sell it for scrap. So what happens when you buy a piece of equipment is you have kind of the stockpile of productive capacity that you use up and you only get one chance. That depreciation, you only get one chance to make a return on it. And then you've got this core amount of money that's parked in the piece of equipment. And you should get an annual return on that. So the, the two parts of the investment then are the part you use up as you use it and the part where you have capital tied up in it that you're going to regain, you know, four years from now when you sell it or trade it in. So we okay. can measure both of those things. Okay. So if we know the level of investment, and uh, then we're going to need to know the operational expense. And there's there's multiple parts here. So there's the overhead, and those those are costs you you incur whether you operate or not. If you have to get insurance, uh, mm -hmm. you know, if you have a salaried person, uh, if you need to pay yourself, you know, those those costs are, are pretty easy to account for, actually. Then we have job specific costs and equipment costs. So what are job specific costs? What are some examples of those? So so job specific costs are, are items that are only incurred for specific locations. So. Uh, for example, if you were going on a logging job and you need to purchase two loads of gravel to build a landing, then you're going to allocate all those costs to that particular job. Or you okay. may have AMP costs. Uh, you might need to buy a right away from the neighbor or something along those lines. Okay. And then the equipment costs are a little bit of what we discussed before, the depreciation and uh, other inputs that, that happen there, uh, variable costs, fuel labor, repairs and maintenance, and so on. Okay. And then, so if we know investment and operational expense, next we need to calculate throughput, or in other words, how much money do you bring in as you produce things? And okay. uh, in uh, logging, for example, that's gonna be the amount you produce in tons and thousand board feet or cords or some combination of those things multiplied by their net prices and that'll give us revenue net price what are the net prices what, what net of what so it'll be net of of stumpage and and trucking so th okay. those those tend to be pretty big costs but we can keep them out to simplify things uh okay. for, for example if you were selling logs for five hundred dollars a thousand board feet and the stumpage was two hundred and fifty dollars a thousand board feet, and the uh, and the trucking was seventy dollars per thousand board feet. You're left with a net price of one eighty to harvest uh, harvest the, the trees, bring them to the landing, merchandise them into products, and load them on a truck. So it's right. it's it's more straightforward to use net prices. And if you're a contract logger, that's that's what you're getting is a net price. Gotcha. So if we have that information, uh, calculating profit then is just the throughput, all that money coming in, less the operational expenses, that's profit. And then return on investment is a relative measure because you take that profit and divide it by your level of investment. You get a percentage. 
you know, so, uh, you know, the two of those in tandem can tell you an awful lot. And so what, what do these tell you about your everyday operations? So if you can tie this to uh, a particular job and you saw that you made a profit, and you might say, what went right here? And you can right. look back and say, oh, we were there and we finished in a, in a short amount of time because we you know, took the time to put in good AMPs and we had good weather and everything went well. And we, you know, priced the job accordingly and so on. So so those things, those things are good. And uh, if, if you start to keep track of, say, the return on investment on every job, you can compare one to the next. OK. Yeah. So so profit by itself doesn't tell us enough. And that's why we need return on investment. All right, so it's sort of the return on investment sort of ensures the more long term value of the operation. It, it does, and it, and it helps really with those comparisons. So, for example, if if I if I made ten thousand dollars, I might be pretty excited about it. If my level of investment was only, you know, twenty thousand dollars, that's a pretty good return on investment. But what if it cost me half a million dollars to make ten thousand dollars? Is that ten thousand as good as the ten thousand I made on on twenty? Right, it's not the same. Yeah, no, it's not not nearly as well. So if we look at different logging jobs, they tend to um, vary in size and scale and product mix and so on. So if you just looked at the profit on one job compared to the next, it's not a good comparison unless the jobs were identical. But if you mm -hmm. compare them based on what sort of return you got on your investment suddenly we have a, a useful comparison and this this sort of information can help people decide what types of harvesting jobs are a good fit for them and it can also help them look into what would i have to do differently to make more profit mm -hmm. or right. if something okay. changed in the market can i still afford to do this okay. all right so with that with that background and throughput accounting, let's let's start to talk about the apps themselves. So the the first one we're going to talk about is Log in Vermont or Live It as I call it, and okay. this is a this is a mobile app. Okay, so it's a website or is it yeah, an it's app? a mobile web app? So so essentially it is a website. So uh, mm -hmm. this app, which is free by the way is found at www.loginvt.com and if you go to that web address and you know if you're trying to follow along with us watching this this webcast maybe you want to take a minute and grab your phone and and punch that that web address into your browser and when it comes up you're going to get a choice between a mobile or desktop version we're going to we're going to talk just about the mobile versions today the desktop ones are just an add-on because you know they're a website and they will work work in either case. So the beauty of these mobile web apps is you don't need to install anything. You can just go to the website. You don't have to worry about updates. The most recent version is always going to be posted and up there and available. All right, one let's see how we use it. Well, one of the things I suggest is that you save the app to your home screen and you can you can save a web, whole website to your home screen on an iPhone or an Android phone and then it, you just see the icon. It looks like any other app. Call it up whenever you want. OK, so the app will just live on the home screen of your phone. It will. So so okay. the way you do that in uh, an iPhone is uh, is the image on the on the left that uh, if you go to the share button, so at the bottom there tends to be a, a box with an arrow pointing out, it will give you a bunch of choices, you know, like like the choice to text or to uh, email. And by the way, you can text or email the app to people. But if you scroll down a little bit more, it says add to home screen. Usually there's a little, a little plus mark. If you do that and, and then close out of that, you're gonna find that an icon for Livit has been put on your home screen or your phone. Anytime you want to use it, you just go there and on an iPhone, it will come up in the Safari browser. OK, OK, so and then on an Android, you're going to be in the Chrome browser and it works in much the same way. You've got to go to settings. I think it's those three little dots there and okay. you'll have this choice share, find and page. You go down a little further. It says add to home screen works the All same right. way. It puts it on your phone. 
So can you use the app if you don't have an internet connection? You can, and that's that, but only if you've put it on your home screen. Uh, so okay. Once it's there, it's already there. You don't have to look for it. And mm -hmm. what's more, browser storage is enabled in these apps. So if you set it up once and and put in the background information, which which we'll talk about in a few minutes here, it'll be there. And from from then on, unless something changes in your business, you can just put in the number of loads or or in, in the ISA app the number of board feet and get results. Okay. So, so let's start to talk about the step-by-step -step instructions. And I just want to show this screen before we, before we switch to the demo. So in the app itself, when you scroll down, you're given a, a choice to go to the step-by-step -step instructions. And it just gives you a description of what you're supposed to do in each tab in order to set it up. Okay. So let's just, just remind one step back. Who is this, who is this app for uh, specifically? Who is it designed for? So the Livet app is really for, for loggers, for logging contractors, and and okay. and particularly uh, for people that are so busy doing the work that they, they just quite never quite get around to doing any analysis of their business. And we're trying to make that easier for them. I think most of them, in the back of their mind, know that they should take a closer look at the numbers and know what jobs are winners and what are losers, and and how to get better at it. But you know, it's not really convenient because they're busy cutting wood. So, um, you know, most people don't need a roadmap to know when they're doing really well or when they're doing really poorly, but it's those in the middle situations where mm -hmm. you're pretty close to break even. And I think what we're going to see in the demo is it doesn't take much to turn a losing job into a winning job if you can do just that much more. Okay. All right, you're ready to switch to a live demo. Yeah, let's take a look. All right, I think now you're looking at the Livid app on my iPhone. Yeah, yep, and, I see. And uh, if, uh, if you're looking at this in uh, sometime in 2021, you're gonna see that uh, a couple of links are built right onto the home screen. One says that one gives you a chance to take the evaluation survey. So, you know, you know we've tested this quite a bit, but it's only now that it's in circulation that we can get people using it and give us to give us more feedback. So if you have a few minutes after you've used it, take the evaluation survey and uh, and tell us about your experience. Or if you just want to send me a quick note that says, hey, this is great or more likely, hey, why doesn't it do this? Or I had a problem doing this or how do I do that? Well, that that green button submit errors or suggestions. If I click that, I'm going to get uh, um, email all made out and ready to go and you can just tell me what you want me to know there and send it on its way. Okay. Okay, so here's the how-to screen which you saw before, step-by-step -step instructions is a good reference to go to, but we're going to talk about how to enter each of the things that are necessary here. All right. And I've got some, some data to work from as I do this. So you'll start with overhead. And overhead, it will ask you for annual to, to, to put in annual numbers for a variety of categories. So I'm going to start with insurance. Okay. And so where's it? Place. I mean, if people don't know these numbers off the top of their head, how should they estimate them? Most people don't know these things off the top of their head. So if they've got a, a, an annual balance sheet from an accountant, that's one place they might find them. But a great place to find them is on your income tax return. So, oh, right. for, for, you know, I have yet to meet the person that in small business who, who underestimates their expenses on their income tax return. So you tend to have... Very good incentive for having all that information there. So that's going to be a Schedule C uh, for uh, somebody with an LLC or any pass-through type of business sole proprietor. Or if you're a corporation, it's IRS Form 1120. And a lot of these categories are here. Okay. So you 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 probably uh, will have to parse through a little bit and, and not take the numbers directly from there, but it's a good starting point. 
So repairs and maintenance, if you're somebody who doesn't break that information out or doesn't keep good track of it, one suggestion I have is to use 7% of your of your gross revenue uh, for repairs okay. and maintenance. So office expense, even though your truck is your office, I bet you have some office expenses, vehicle expenses. So this is one in working with loggers where I see it might be easy to accidentally underestimate this. So in vehicle expenses, I'm not talking about trucking forest products, I'm talking about your pickup truck that you use to carry your tools and your fuel tank and go to work. Mm -hmm. Many loggers, when they're having a very good year, do something uh, called a Section 179 deduction. It lets them write off the entire purchase price in a year. And if your right. accountant thinks that's a great idea, it's a great idea because it lowers your tax burden in this year. However, in subsequent years, it's going to look like your, your vehicle expense is pretty low. That's not really the case. So what I suggest you do is take the number of miles you drove and multiply it by that, uh, you know, the government's, the federal government's annual, or their mileage rate of, you know, 56 cents or whatever it might be right now. Okay, so it's just the mileage times the, the federal rate. Right, and it tends to be, a, you know, a pretty big number. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to keep entering numbers here. You know, it's asking me utilities. And that's everything from your, your power bill in your shop to your mobile phone and, and things along, along those lines. And then there's a category for other expenses. So if there's something else that doesn't fit neatly into that category, but it's a real number and you know it because you spent it, you can add it in right there. Okay. It's not hard in a small business to quickly get to an overhead level of you know $50,000 or so. Uh-huh. So once those are in, we're going to go to the business specs. Okay. So here it's going to ask the equipment value, your logging equipment value at the start of the year. Right. And I'll go ahead, I'm going to put $650,000 there. And then it's going to ask, what's the value of this equipment at the end of the year? All right. Fair market so we're getting, value, to, real value. We're getting into some of this depreciation that we talked yes. about earlier. Yes. Yes. So you should always use whatever depreciation schedule has been recommended by your accountant because they're looking out for you and trying to minimize your tax burden. That might be straight line depreciation. You might depreciate it, you know, more quickly than it's really wearing out, but within the legal limits, you know, you're, you're following the rules. What right. we're doing here though is something a little bit different. We wanna know how much of that equipment's, equipment's value is really used up. Right. And, you know, if we start with a, a equipment value of 650,000, and at the end of the year, it's worth 575,000, well, you have used up $75,000 worth of value in that year, that's your level of investment or an important part of the measurement of your level of investment. We can allocate that by day. And then we get this core equipment value. And I'm going so to you're saying that um, for tax purposes, you should follow your accountant's advice based on what they say for depreciation. But here you might do something a little bit different and you want to get the fair market value at the beginning of the year and the fair market value at the end of the year and it might be slightly different than what your, your accountant is using on your taxes. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, and, 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 you know, there's no real conflict there. Do, do you know, what the accountant asks for the, for the purpose they're asking, which is really to minimize your taxes. And that what we're asking here is a more accurate or more precise measurement of the real value. If you think about it, you could fully depreciate a piece of equipment and still own it and operate it, and you certainly wouldn't give it away, so it has value. So, right, okay. so I'm going to put a core value in here, and this might be uh, a, a resale value or trade-in value, mm -hmm. or or if you plan to really use it up, it might just be a, a scrap value. If you plan to own that piece of equipment forever, and I know some of those people, right, that do mm -hmm. that. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's money you have parked in this equipment that you need to have an annual return on, or we need to measure your annual return on. So that's why, that's how we get at those two different things. So once okay. we put that in there, we go to weeks of production. 
in a year. And this will only, believe it or not, it won't let you work 52 weeks a year. It only goes up to 50. And okay. what I'm really getting at is how many weeks are you set up and producing? So mm -hmm. uh, many people work all the time, but it doesn't mean you're always cutting wood and putting it on the truck and shipping it out. Mm -hmm. I hear everything from 30 to 45 weeks a year. Some people say 48 weeks a year they operate. If you're at the higher end of that, if you're at 45 weeks or more, my hat's off to you because you're an exceptional project manager, or maybe you're kind of pushing the limits of acceptable management practices, one or the other. But whatever that number of weeks is, put it in. I'm going to use 40 in our example here. Uh, as we go down, annual overhead was carried over from the other sheet. Then we've got uh, annual equipment payments. So that's going to be your monthly payment times 12. And what I'm doing with this is I'm going to count your equipment costs as the larger of your payments or your depreciation. All right. So what is your equipment all paid off? So if your equipment's all paid off, you are still using it up. So there's a cost there. And mm -hmm. this gets into the, that, that tricky situation where uh, you might think you have positive cash flows because the depreciation isn't coming out of your pocket. So it's important in an app like this, in an accounting situation like this, that we, we take care of it. So we'll use the larger of, of um, your equipment payments or your depreciation. Okay. Appreciation. Okay, then we're going to get into annual payroll. Right. So any of your employees, they're the full cost of having them and their mm -hmm. fringe benefits and workman's comp or other things like that. That's all going to go in here. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, if you're an owner operator, we have to put a living wage for you in there if we, if we want accurate answers. Now, maybe you don't pay yourself. That was me, my question. <laughs> what if you don't actually pay yourself like a salary? So even, if you, even if you don't pay yourself a salary, and that's a pretty common situation. I don't pay myself a salary, but mm -hmm. we have to account for our time. So otherwise, it's going to look like you made a big profit, but all you really did was pay for your time. So we want to okay. take that out. So so profit then is going to be anything over and above that living wage. And, and think of it as the, as the reward for the risk you took by going into business. So okay. I'm going to use $75,000 there to say cover an over owner and an employee for much of the year. Weekly fuel consumption, I'm going to put 500 gallons here. And then fuel price. So this is going to be an off-road diesel price. Unless your equipment runs on something else. And I'll put that in. And we're most of the way there. Next, we've okay. got to enter the products. And I've gone ahead and entered four different product categories, uh, hardwood pulp, hardwood saw logs, softwood saw logs, and firewood. And all it's asking you here is the net dollars per load. Doesn't matter what load size, what kind of truck you use, anything like that. Doesn't matter if it's tons or board feet or cords. It just wants to know how many dollars net for each load. Right. And the so, user can input the various types of products there. Those are preset. Right, they can they can put those in. I've only uh, I've only just added them in uh, myself, so okay. just for convenience right now. So I'm going to put in some prices here. I'll put a net of seven hundred on pulp. Maybe we'll say nine hundred on the hardwood logs. And again, this is net of stumpage and trucking. Right? So stumpage and trucking. Okay. And I'll put those numbers in and then later all we need to put in is the number of loads. So with that done, we're going to go in and look at results. Okay. So so on uh, the tab where you calculate results, you can select a time frame. You can look at a week, a month, a whole job or a year. I didn't put a day in there because that will make you crazy in logging because there's a lot of days things don't go really well, and there's many days that go terrific, and either extreme isn't going to help you. So let's look at a week. Okay. And we'll look at the level of production uh, in that week, and let's just say that they put out, let's say five loads, I'm yeah, five loads of hardwood pulp, three loads of hardwood saw logs, and a load of softwood saw logs, 
and a load of firewood. Okay. So I've entered those, and then I have a couple more things to put in. Job specific costs. I have to enter job specific costs. Right. So normally you have to move your equipment to a job, so you've got a one way move there. And uh -huh. and then you may have some additional items like, you know, gravel or a right of way or um, some equipment time for cleanup, that sort of thing. So I'm going to go ahead and put two thousand dollars in right here. Income from services. This is a lot less common than uh, than uh, job specific costs, but it can happen. So just a payment that the landowner would pay you, a one-time yeah. payment. Yeah, so. and that, that'll come up. Suppose that uh, you're going to bring gravel in and it's going to be a permanent improvement that they'll benefit from, and you have a conversation, and they say, okay, if it's uh, $500 for that load, I'll split it with you, so I'll give you $250. All right. So we'll put that in there. And then it's asking the number of weeks planned on the job. You can be wrong about this. It doesn't, you know, it won't change things very much, but it's your your best guess of how long you're going to be there. And so I'm going to say this is a five week job. Efforts at at 100%. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll talk about that in a minute. But the profit then for the week here is $803, and uh, and uh, the return on investment is a pretty healthy 24.7%. Yeah, that looks good. Yeah, that's that's not too bad. I wonder though if uh, if something went wrong and we didn't get that last load, what would happen? Just take out the load of firewood and see what happens. Okay. Still made money. The return on investment went way down. Went way down. And mm -hmm. that's the thing about return on investment. Uh, you're going to find that uh, it goes up and down. Uh, sometimes it'll look really terrific. Remember, it's only for the time period specified. So. You know, you might get a 200% return on investment sometime. I defy you to get that for the year, though. It's just not going to happen. But you might get it for a week, and mm -hmm. that's the good news. The bad news is some weeks it's going to be in the red, and it's not going to look mm -hmm. really as good. So mm -hmm. suppose that uh, things really didn't go well, and you only got two loads of hardwood saw logs, and suddenly a two load difference means it's it's the it's the almost the complete opposite of where we started. You've lost seven hundred and fifty dollars yeah. and the return on investment is negative twenty three percent. This is not an uncommon thing. Uh, right. but you don't want it to be here every week. Right. You know, I, I haven't met anyone who didn't have a bad week once in a while. But let's let's go back to uh, here and and reinstate that healthy production level. Yeah. And talk about this idea of percent effort because it's going to yeah. ask you. Okay, what? So, what does it mean to be working? So you can work more than a hundred percent effort. What does you that can. mean? So you can, you know, just like in college football, you can give one hundred and ten percent. Let's use one hundred and twenty percent as an example, though. So I put up to one hundred and twenty percent. You'll notice that the profit went down. And the return on investment went down. Well, there's a couple of things going on here. One, if I give 120% effort, uh, I would expect more output. So let's add a couple loads in here because we worked extra. So we've done that and it paid off. Right. But, okay. But, but how can you actually give more than 100%? Well, that well, wasn't my question. I mean, does that mean a long day or adding a day or what does that mean? Yeah, that's exactly what it means. So the 100% is just of your average. So the app has actually calculated your weekly average based on the cost structure you entered and the number of weeks in a year. So oh, okay. uh, some weeks, though, might be, be better or worse than others. For example, in uh, uh, you know the, the coldest part of the winter and there's not a whole lot going on and you're hoping to finish the job before uh, spring breakup and you might just say hey you know what for the month of February we're going to work on Saturdays and, and I know an awful lot of people that do that so you're working six days you've added 20 percent to your week so I would call right. that 120 percent effort now hopefully you get more loads out as a result right. uh, more commonly though we might drop to say 
uh, in a lot of the year, 80% or less. You know, that can happen. So that's like if you can't work a day or you have to do a short day or something like that. Exactly. So as we talk about this, it's April. There's a lot of loggers who aren't working or are working on a site where they got to be very careful. So they work on the dry days and then it rains and they're shut down for a day or so. Uh, and, and that's gotten increasingly common around the region and, you know, right in through June and, and other parts of the year. So if you only work four days and you produce less wood, you know, you can just you can still see how that worked out. So 80 percent effort and and a total of nine loads, still a 23.2 percent return on investment. Not too bad. If it was raining, though, and things went, you know, not so not so well and you got down to say eight loads, you're right around break even there. Mm -hmm. Right. And Yeah, and I, I think many loggers in the region at certain times of the year are content to break even because that's all the ground is gonna allow them to do. And if you can do that at some times of the year and make a good profit the rest of the time of year, it kind of carries things along. Okay. So if I've calculated this for the week, or for an entire job, and I really recommend figuring out how you did at the end of a job when you, you know, when you move on to the next job, figure out how you did and keep that record. Well, there's ways to keep a record and the app will help you with that. If I scroll down here and go to print or save report, I am uh, given a kind of a printer friendly, a printer friendly report, a lot of white background. So my, creatively named company, ABC Logging. And then we were just working on the old Smith farm. And I've got a report and I can scroll to the bottom here and there's a button that says print this and it calls up a printer and I can send it, you know, to a wireless printer. So you can, you can hook your phone to a wireless printer and send it and do it, do it that way. Okay. But you know, this is 2021 and we don't print that much anymore. I encourage you to print as many copies as you want because trees are renewable, but realistically an electronic copy might be easier to keep track of. One way you can do that is just to take a screenshot and and uh, you know save it to your, your camera roll, send it to your bookkeeper. Uh, mm -hmm. If you really wanna brag to your friend, I suppose you can do it that way. Or, you know, a more um, formal way of doing it is to go down to the share button and it will look differently on, a, on an Android phone. And then I'm given a choice of sending this to, to a bunch of people and I can click on options and I'll go to PDF. It's a portable document format. It'll make a PDF report. I'm going to press the um, email there and because if I want to send this to someone and I know someone who's very interested in studying this report so I'm going to send this off to Allison and there you should you should have that later and right. you can review it. All right so then that'll just email a PDF to you could e email it to yourself if you want to do it that way. You could and I and I think you could probably send it directly to Dropbox or or some other cloud service as a, as a way of keeping track. So that's a look at the Libid app. Okay, cool. If people have questions about it, it, the best way to address those is just through that green button there, submit errors or suggestions. Yes, go ahead and, and hit the submit errors or suggestions. It'll bring up the email and you can send a note. And, uh, you, know, you know, I don't think I'm going to get overwhelmed with feedback. I'll probably get a reasonable amount and I will respond to anyone who contacts me. So go ahead and send that in. Sounds good. So we are going to stop talking about this and start talking about the ISAW app. All right. So this one's similar, but for a different audience. Yes. Okay. So the ISAW app, which can be found at www.isawvt.com. And again, it's a free app. It's a mobile web app. Again, it's a website. If you go to that address, uh, 
it will give you a choice to use the mobile or desktop version. But but like you said, Allison, this is meant for a slightly different audience. So this is intended for people with portable sawmills that are that are part of their business. So maybe their entire business is a portable sawmill, or maybe it's a sideline. A lot of loggers and farmers and rural folks like to have a bandsaw and do some of this as a as a sideline. If you have a bigger sawmill, uh, this might not be for you. And I, I'd really recommend that you look into the Forest Services cost software. Cost stands for cost of sawing timber, and you can find that on the Forest website. So, okay. so we'll talk about about using uh, using ISAW. Again, if you you look at it, it has a, a how to tab with these instructions, and this works in much the same way as a Livid app, but there are some differences. So I think what I'll do now is pull up a copy of this, and we'll look at it, and uh, and we'll do a demo with it. All right, yeah, it looks a lot like the first one. We'll see how it's different. Looks a lot like it, with a slightly different color scheme and a and a different and a different photo. So again, if you're looking at this sometime in 2021, it probably has a link to take an evaluation survey. Give me some formal feedback on how I might uh, make improvements or or make sure it's doing the things that that are helpful to you as as someone with a sawmill. And there's also just a direct link to send an email and submit errors and suggestions. So those are there. The how to tab, we, ju we just really saw step by step instructions for for each of the tabs that I showed. And we may as well jump in and uh, try to use it a little bit. So earlier today I came in and filled this out and put some numbers in. So. Okay. Because this is really for smaller scale portable sawmill owners, the numbers you see here look quite a bit smaller in terms of overhead than than we saw for uh, the logging operation. You know, if you you have one of these sawmills, but you have a big pole barn and yard and a dry kiln, and it's it's bigger scale than I might be envisioning right now, there's no reason this won't work, and you can't put those numbers in there. But we just, you know. For now, we're going to use some numbers appropriate to uh, a sideline business. All right. So, uh, insurance, repairs and maintenance, office expense, vehicle expenses, work supplies, travel, utilities, and of course, other expenses. So, I have total annual overhead here of $6,650. And you know, not a big number, but uh, an example number, I guess. It's all real similar to what we looked at with the logging app. Very similar, and then when we get into the business specs, we get into some some differences. So, much like in the other one, it's going to ask you for the equipment's value at the start of the year mm -hmm. and at the end of the year. So this could be your sawmill, but it could be other items that you use in connection with it. So if you use a log loader or uh, a tractor, and that's part of the mix. You can you can throw it in there. Uh, okay. So in my example here, I've got a sawmill that was worth eighteen thousand at the start of the year and seventeen thousand at the end of the year. The thing about these portable sawmills is, in comparison to logging equipment, they hold their value. You, you may wear them out, but you don't wear them out the way you do logging equipment. Nothing wears out equipment the way logging equipment does, but. Uh, you know, so so it's probably a little less on that depreciation part of the investment, and more in this core value. So I've got a core equipment value of twelve thousand dollars. There's right. twelve thousand dollars in this mill that must get an annual return, okay. and so that's factored in here. So instead of annual weeks of production here, I have annual days of production, and that's okay. because you have a lot of folks who might saw one day a week, say four right. weeks of the year. Or you know, if it's more than that, it can be up to. We can go all the way up to 365 days, I think. All right, so you could use a few saw yeah. most days, but it's it's you you you're sort of thinking that most people will will 
not be doing this as an everyday operation. Right. This this is particularly in rural Vermont and in really in rural America. Uh, there's a lot of folks with these sawmills, and it's it's a sideline for some folks. It's a hobby, but for a lot of people, it's a really just a great productive sideline that they can do. It, it fits their schedule. They have access, uh, particularly to softwood logs, and there's always someone. You know, I talked to one guy who runs this, and he'll only go out, uh, you know, almost in the dark and run it because if his neighbors see him sawing, they come and they want to buy lumber from him, and he's not really wanting to be at that scale of things. So annual overhead was carried over, equipment payments, annual payroll. So that number doesn't look very high, does it? But we're talking about 40 days of sawing. All oh, right, yeah. So, so, so that's annual payroll for what, and maybe that's with a helper. You, you uh, can get a lot more done with two people with one of these sawmills than you can with one because there's a lot of handling involved. Two so you people. have to separate out or estimate the payroll that's only associated with this sawmill. It, it, exactly. So it's going to be dictated by the number of days. If you've got a larger operation, but you only work at it for so many days a year, then figure out your daily payroll and scale it accordingly. Daily fuel consumption. These are not big fuel users. So I don't have a particularly big price there. And I've got a, a gasoline fuel price. I'm going to use... $3 a gallon, whatever example I use, the price will be different when, when people see it. And it's probably somewhere north of that this week. Okay, so I've put in uh, those business specs and now I've got to enter products. Okay. And I've listed three here, uh, four by four lumber, I'm sorry, four quarter lumber, six by six beams and two by six lumber, and then a price per board foot. Okay. So once those are in there, and I can add, you know, up to 10 products, whatever it is you're sawing, you can put in. Okay. And then I can go to calculate results. And here it's going to carry over your product names and your prices. Right. And then you've got to put in daily production or you've got to put in production for whatever time frame you select. So okay. day, whole job or a year. A whole job might be a whole order in this case. All right. So if you're hired by someone to come to their property and saw up their pile of logs, then it's for as long as you're there. You know, right. you might have to estimate the number of days. But let's look at what can be done in a day here. And I'm suggesting that this person is gonna is gonna produce uh, 800 board feet of four quarter lumber, 700 board feet of six by six beams, and 350 feet of two by six lumber. And then I've got to add a couple other things. The log costs, right. well, if you're sawing for your neighbor and it's their pile of logs, your log cost is zero. But if you need to buy the logs, you paid something for them. So, and that's gonna be reflected in your product prices. So I'm gonna use $400 here. And then slab and sawdust revenue. So large scale sawmills have uh, regular outlets for what they call co-products slabs sawdust and those sort of things and they they count on that revenue and hope to hope to move it in an efficient way small scale sawmills have more of a problem they have lots of slabs and sawdust and mm -hmm. you know in the right location you can you can sell your slabs you can cut it up sell it for firewood and um, I don't know if you can sell your sawdust, you can probably tra trade it to the neighbor for some eggs or something like that. But in any case, you might have a little bit of revenue here. So I'm gonna put $25 okay. in one day of sawing. And it looks like for the day, over and above a wage, this person has made $98 and got a healthy 30% return on investment. Hey, that's another nice looking return on investment. Yeah, that's 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 not bad. You know, it's a it's a fairly low level of investment. Now, if this was someone who also purchased a tractor or a log loader to go with it, or a truck to make deliveries, and the level of investment gets higher, and you've either got to be putting more out or realize an increase in prices. Mm -hmm. Now, su suppose that I've got a couple products that are selling for sixty cents a board foot, and suppose that drops. And let's change those to 55 cents. Okay, so the prices have to be changed in this um, drop down in the in the um, under the prices. They can't be changed under the products screen. Y yes, they have to go back 
uh, to the products. You can't do it in the in the results column. So if I go there back there though, seven percent return on investment, which seven percent in some fields is pretty good, but twenty three dollars of profit in a day of sawing is is not that great. Right. Uh, certainly, people have had days like that, but it's something you would you would strive for more. Mm -hmm. One of the things you might do is find a way to produce more. So if you can figure out how to align your production in a way that keeps your bottleneck busy, you're going to have maybe a couple hundred more board feet, and suddenly we're up to that healthy uh, profit of $133 for the day and a return on investment of 40.8%. Okay. So in, in both of these apps, you can kind of play the what if game right. once you get down to the results. You, you know what you did and you can say, what, what would I want to do differently? Or what might I do differently to make more money? Or you might say, what's going to happen if fuel goes up by a dollar a gallon? You can model all those things and, and change things and, and see how it see how it goes. So that's how you use the ISAW app. And then much like before, if you want to save your records and your report. OK, so the business name is Slab City and the job name is Timbers and everything's there. If I click on the print this, it will give me the choice of the wireless printer that's a few feet from me here and I can send it there and print it. Mm -hmm. Don't really want to do that, uh, so I'm going to cancel that. But I can also share it, so right. I could actually, I could actually share the whole web page as is. It would send it. I don't want to do uh, that. I want to send a PDF. Yes. And so, Allison, I know you're thinking of buying a sawmill, so I'm going to send this to you so you can scrutinize it. Okay, I'll look at those numbers. So that's on your way, on its way to you. So that's a look at the ISAW app. All right. And it, um, it works on either Android or iPhone, just the same as the Livet. Either one. You know, slightly different process if you want to, if you want to, uh, Save it to your home screen on either one of those. So we're we're coming to the end of our presentation here. Uh, I want to take a minute to summarize what we've talked about. So we went through an explanation of throughput accounting. Uh, and this provides you with key performance indicators of financial success, so profit and return on investment. And so making these measurements at the right time can help make operational decisions about a logging and our sawmill operation such as what jobs or prices to accept what i tried to do in these apps is let you take uh, common key performance indicators like number of loads in a week or number of board feet and then put them in and get those financial indicators profit and return on investment so with those things you can you can start to figure out what might i do differently in my business or what am i doing well and, and should should keep on doing so live it and i saw provide those calculations uh, and these apps are free relatively easy to use i i encourage people to put them on their phone test them if you have uh suggestions Get in touch with me. The links are there, and and I'll try to uh, try to you know get right back to you. All right. So while we have a minute, let's uh, let's talk about the Forest Business School. All right. Well, yeah. So this has been up behind your logo has been up behind your shoulder the whole time. But what exactly is the Forest Business School? So the Forest Business School is meant to provide people in the working landscape with training uh, and resources like like this webcast to help them with their business so so we hold uh, annually a six month um, program really geared for mid-career professionals so small business owners key employees and family members and some public agency people. So we've had all those people in our mix and we talk about things that will 
help them make better decisions in their business. And then apart from that, we lo I'm looking to do more of these webcasts and, and, and provide more educational resources. Okay. So can people from outside Vermont participate in this school? Yes, so it's the Vermont Forest Business School and there is a Vermont only session every year, but uh, the program itself is gonna be available starting in the coming fall for people from anywhere in the country to enroll and, and participate. Uh, the program is really meant to work for people who have you know, a full-time occupation. So we, we use things like audiobooks and podcasts to uh, you know, allow them to fit it into their day, do it on their commute or while they're working in a machine. And then we meet once a week remotely and talk about these things. And by the end of the program, you're gonna end up with a peer group of people, you know, people with similar challenges and problems and people in similar um, places in life that you can can rely on and, and go to for, you know, support, feedback and, and ideas. And where do people find out more about? So so you're going to want to go to the the VTFBS.com website, Vermont Forest Business School website, and there's more information there. So thanks again to Vermont Working Lands for making all of this possible. Uh, you know, it's, it's through their support that these apps are available free to anyone in Vermont and really anyone anywhere else. And uh, I can't say enough uh, about the good work they're doing to support the working landscape for people in Vermont. Great, thanks Steve. Thanks, thanks Allison. Bye everyone. <laughs>